peace, peace. You know what it is. It's your man, S-K-Y-Z-O-O, Sky Zoo, live from the borough. And this is the Pay Me No Mind podcast. This is Ray Flores, the ring announcer for Premier Boxing Champions. You are listening to the Pay Me No Mind podcast with my man, Wood. Hold it, Magic Man, Malinaji, giving a big shout out to the Pay Me No Mind podcast. What's up, everybody? This is Swift Jerry Heard, 20 and 0, 14 knockouts, the new IBF champion of the world. And uh, I'm right here with the Pay Me No Mind show. Yo, it's your boy John Connor, and you're checking out the Pay Me No Mind podcast. It's Aftermath, and ain't nothing after that. Flint, we in the building. It's Connor, what? You are listening to Pay Me No Mind with show host Wood. get this one out there because <clears throat> one of the guests tonight is Tiffany Daniels who is the PR she's uh, handling PR for Wired Promotions and uh, Wired Promotions is a boxing promoter and other he, he does other things too but um, they have a show coming up two nights from now that's Friday night in Cincinnati Ohio so I wanted Tiffany to come on and talk about that uh, unfortunately I won't be at this event um I was at the last one in February, and, uh, you know, I just really wanted to support what they were trying to do in Cincinnati, and um, so, like I said, it, trying to do something, I at least wanted her to come on and kind of talk about the event, and um, we couldn't get into too many of the details, because as you know, with most of these smaller cards, or these club cards, um, they're very, uh, you know, they, they're in flux until they actually happen, so, um, but check her out. We also discussed a little bit of um, women's boxing. And then um, Tiffany, um, kind of like six degrees of separation, she also has covered some boxing in the past for uh, Inside the Ropes. And speaking of Inside the Ropes, uh, tonight's last guest is uh, Luki Cattell of Inside the Ropes. Um, so I know you've probably seen the Inside the Ropes um YouTube channel and uh, his podcast. I've been on there a couple of times. Uh, all he's got a ton of uh, video content and whatnot. So um, <clears throat> you know, Lukey's on here, and then also because we're in the NBA season, I wanted to add some variety to the show. Also have Damian Adams of uh, the Real Deal with Damian Adams. Uh, his podcast, YouTube channel, Instagram, everything is uh, the Real Deal. Um, it might be WDA on uh, Instagram, but uh, if you Google it, you can find Damian Adams. I uh, wanted him to come on and talk some uh, basketball. He's a huge NBA fan. You know me. I'm a little limited with my NBA uh, support. You know, I support my Pistons first and foremost. And then the rest of this stuff, uh, if I don't see real competition, you know I'm out. I just don't have time to sit around and watch a bunch of guys hoist up three pointers, um, you know, when that's really not the formula for them to win. But um, before we do get into the uh, the guest segments, I, I will talk about tonight was Game Five of uh, the Eastern Conference Finals, and I'm pretty shocked that um, I'm pretty shocked that Boston pulled it out. But I think we saw very early. This is when we get into that argument about LeBron being better than Jordan. Uh, and I know LeBron carries, you know, so much more on his shoulders, so much more rests on his shoulders for them to, for the Cleveland uh, Cavaliers to win a game. I know this roster is, uh, you know, has its flaws. Uh, it's highly flawed. But um, it's almost like LeBron comes out there. We see how it's going in the first quarter, you know, second quarter. Uh, we just don't have it tonight. Um I'm just going to find a way to extend the series. You know, we got to go back to Cleveland. I know I'm going to be in my home gym. I'm going to have my home crowd. And, you know, uh, my team is there, his business team I'm speaking of, and his and his family watching him. And he's going to be on 100, and they'll probably win. And as we can see, um, some of the uh, – you know, some of the young Celtics found it very hard. They have they haven't been able to score on the road at all very much throughout these playoffs. So it, it's almost like uh, LeBron is out there calculating. You know, 
what all I have going on here. And, you know, you try. But ultimately, you know, you're up against it. And you just concede the game. Save some energy. You know, you get a little bit of stats. And you try. But ultimately, I'm just going to get to my game six at home. Come out fresh and prepared to put up my 40. And uh, see if we can get it back to Boston. And then we're going to see if these boys can beat me in a best of one. And uh, that's kind of what it was was going into this, into the postseason in general was I'm not going to believe an Eastern Conference team can put the Cavaliers out of the uh, playoffs until they actually win the fourth game in a best of seven. That's that's just how it's going to be for me. So, uh, but no knock on LeBron. He had a hell of a game tonight, um, it pretty much. But the only thing is he had six turnovers. I think in that last loss they had um, in that series, I think he had seven turnovers that game. I believe maybe in – that might have been game one. He had the seven turnovers. But um, it, it's just, a, you know, it's it's mathematic for him. And um, where else was I going to go with this before we get on? Um, let me pull up some some stats real quick. Obviously, the one uh, really impressive thing is what the young boy uh, Tatum is able to do. And, um, you know, he led the way tonight for them. And I think they're a formidable team if he's on his offensive game. Um, What was it, 96 to 83 tonight? I'm pulling it up real quick. Yeah, LeBron with uh, 26 points, still shot 50% from the field, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, but again, the 6 turnovers. I think the one thing that's killing the Cavaliers, man, is your shooting guard, J.R. Smith. And I emphasize shooting guard. This man was 1 for 6, 0 for 4 from 3-point range. He's basically useless handling the, handling the ball out on the perimeter. Uh, if he's not catching and shooting high difficulty, you know, type three pointers, you know, he doesn't even really drive to the basket anymore the way that he did earlier uh, in his career in Denver. And uh, you know, he was a pretty he's a pretty athletic guy. I remember some of his highlight dunks, uh, but we don't even see any of that anymore. And uh, when he does, he just came out in the first quarter on a couple of uh, possessions and just went to getting beyond his third or fourth dribble, wasn't going anywhere with it, and then just pulls out of his, his whatever he was trying to do, just abandons it and just threw a careless pass uh, somewhere, and it ended up being a turnover. Uh, he had, uh, it looks like he only had one turnover for the game. Could have sworn he threw away at least two earlier uh, in the, in that first quarter, but he's just not a um, his plus minus was uh, nineteen negative nineteen. George Hill, the point guard, by position only in name only, he was a negative twenty one, and then Kevin Love was a negative twenty three. So. Um, just not much uh, help for LeBron tonight, who himself was also a negative uh, 11. But um, I, like I said, I'm not going to put all this on LeBron. I think it's just strategic. Um, you, you knew early on Boston was able to maintain, you know, that, that 9 to 13-point uh, lead for a long stretch in the game. And uh, they just warmed down. Um, and like I said, LeBron is just trying to get it back to Cleveland. That's it. I will say um, Tatum, you know, shooting 50%, 7 from 15, 7 of 15. Uh, Horford was 4 of 9. Um, Rozier, you know, he's a guy I just talked about, J.R. Smith being the, the weak link. Um, Rozier, high energy guy, you know, a scrappy guy, and he's from Cleveland, but hasn't done well, hasn't put fared, fared too well in Cleveland, and uh, he, he missed 12 straight shots tonight. 
And that's going to be critical in Cleveland because, uh, you know, if he goes out and, and, and has a similar stat line tonight, I think he was 3 of 15. Yes, 3 for 15, 1 for 7 from 3-point range. Only one turnover, so okay. So, you know, not a bad game in that regard, you know, being a point guard. Uh, we'll see how many assists. Uh, six assists, you know, not too bad. But, again, you, you know, he can't miss 12 shots in a row in uh, Cleveland. You're going to have to uh, either find some more positive ways to impact the game or uh, just be making, you know, more shots than he's missing for them to have a shot. Um, but like I said, I, I'm very impressed that they were able to get this game tonight and um, to win it by, by double digits. You know, I, I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have believed that like four or five hours ago. So, um, you know, salute to Stevens for regrouping with the team and uh, winning a, a key game because, um, you know, I just didn't think it was possible. Um, Golden State, I don't, I don't really want to get into the Golden State um, Houston series, I think. That's probably going seven games now. I was picking six games uh, when that started. But um, it looks like Houston, you know, is now four, uh, has won four of seven games against uh, Golden State. And I think they've won two at uh, Royal Core Arena. So they're kind of uh, proving that they're for real. And, um, you know, these guys that I didn't give much of a chance, Tucker, Ariza, uh, Gordon has stepped it up. Guys, I really wouldn't have believed in getting it done. And then Paul, um, which I heard something interesting from Stephen A., which I don't know if it was mentioned at the time of the trade or the, the signing of Chris Paul in Houston. But I didn't know that he wanted – supposedly Stephen A. said that he wanted to be moved off of the ball and he didn't want to bear all the responsibility on the offensive end as far as uh, facilitating everything and, and setting the table for everybody. He wanted to be able to move off of the ball per Stephen A. Smith and um, show that he could score, be freed up to score, and just not carry, uh, you know, not dealing with all the pressure of trying to run a team, um, you know, dribbling and controlling the ball as much, dominating the ball as much as he typically did when he was with the Clippers. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, the only other thing I really wanted to get into sports-wise was uh, the NFL came out today and announced that they have um, revised their policy on the national anthem. Um, it was interesting, the timing of it. You know, I mean, obviously it's the NFL, so it's going to attract a lot of, uh, you know, it's going to be the, uh, the headline and it's going to be some, uh, some a topic that a lot of time is – devoted to on sports talk radio and podcasts and whatnot. But um, just quickly, I feel like it's it's a decent um, compromise. I mean, there's options for everybody in, involved. Uh, players who want to stay in the locker room, from what I could tell in the ESPN piece, if you want to stay back in the locker room, you can do that. Uh, if you are out on the field, any players and any personnel for any team all must stand. If not, the team can be uh, – the team will be fined. And then I believe there also there was also some language in it that uh, – Instagram update or uh, notification right there, if that's making it into the sound. But, um, yeah, and then the, the team can then find its – players and or personnel and the interesting thing is um I, I believe that the nfl pa already mentioned that they were going to go back and make sure that these fines couldn't uh because they they put this in the um i forget what what they called it but they put it into the into the rules or the op the operating manual uh for uh for operating an nfl game so I don't think that is really subject to the uh, collective bargaining agreement being that it's put into this, uh, you know, under this category of the bylaws or whatever, what have you. But I think it's fair, man. I mean, um, I think the only thing is going to be, you know, somebody is going to always complain. 
you know, some 30 to probably 47% is always going to be out there complaining and nothing is good. Nothing is good enough. And I think the interesting thing will be once some of the guys start deciding how they, what they want to do, I would imagine it's a critical mass of the players who just go out there and stay it. Um, you know, I would imagine it's a, it's a, it's a good percentage of guys who believe they should be out there and they should stand and it's the right thing to do. It's what they've always done and don't even question it. Uh, but I do believe it may be, um, some small percentage, maybe less than 10%, maybe right around 10%. I don't know that some guys who have some concerns, um, you know, about the song and what we've come to, what's been publicized about, you know, some of the, the, the second and third verses of the Star Spangled Banner. And it may be some guys who uh, who just object to to going on, getting along, going along to get along at this point. And um, it could be some guys that stay in the back. And as some fans become aware of the individuals that are choosing to do that, um, I think it's going to be a, a, a chance where some fans uh, are upset about it. You know, one thing that we haven't heard much about is all of the African-American uh, fans from last year who boycotted the game. Um I, don't, I wonder what's going on with that. I haven't been in social media too much to see what the the call is. I know my barber uh, last year, uh, my old barber, I, um, I know he was uh, adamant, you know, that, or he was, uh, you know, he stuck to his commitment to not watch uh, football all year last year. And, uh, you know, he asked me about it every haircut, you know, for a good 10 weeks out of the season. And so it'll be interesting where, you know, some African-American uh, fans are with how they're supporting the game this year, uh, whether they're coming back or whether some just got used to not watching the game last year and, you know, aren't coming back. And then uh, we'll have to see what, um, you know, what uh, white fans do and, you know, from other ethnicities, how they choose to approach it this year. But again, um, somebody's going to be unhappy. And, um, I would imagine that if there's, if it's really vocal about the people that are objecting to the players who don't come out, then I could imagine that in the African American community, um, you know, there could be some type of response, you know, to go back to um i forget what the hashtag campaign was last year but um it'll be interesting to see what the response of uh you know the black fans who uh who responded last year to people not being you know the, the masses not understanding the reason for uh the kneeling and whatnot but um again i think it's um uh, i think it'll be a large number of guys you know some rookies coming in who just don't have a position one way or the other. I think it's some other guys who uh, would just be out there um, and right now I'm looking at it the the press conference is getting ready to happen for uh, the post presser for uh, the Cavaliers. And to go back to the NBA really quickly, that's another thing that has to wear on uh, LeBron James. It's not gonna be another Cavalier. It's not gonna be Tyron Lou up on this, the uh, you know, up on the at the table, or on the panel with LeBron. LeBron is just gonna go up there by himself, and he's the one that has to answer for why J.R. Smith scored one point. It's just gonna be LeBron up there. I'm sorry, J.R. Smith had two points. Tristan Thompson had one point. Looks like Tristan Thompson might have had 11 rebounds. Um, no, he had six rebounds. One offensive and five defense, defensive rebounds. So LeBron is going to have to speak to why t Tom wasn't as uh, active as he has been, you know, in, in the games where they won. 
I guess he'll also have to talk about, um, you know, he, he just has to go up there and answer for everything. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a burden on that brother. But um, anyway, finishing up on the NFL thing. Uh, it'll be interesting. Like I said, I, I don't think it'll be, um, it may not be as big a deal, you know, by uh, at least once we get into the third, fourth, or fifth week of it. You know, I'm sure the uh, the television, the television uh, cameras will get tired of like being on a witch a witch hunt for uh, guys who weren't out on the field. I mean, at some point in time, I think it'll be better for you know the network's interest will be better served if they don't draw a lot of attention to who's out there, who's not. If there's a slick way to do it. Um, you know, to just kind of uh, avoid bringing attention to so and so who wasn't out there, you know, I think it would it would be like I said, I think their interest would be better served if they found a way to kind of uh, finesse that and just move on. Um, but anyway, that's that. Um, you know, I'm thinking about doing some entertainment, maybe doing a second show each week. Once I get a little more consistent and once I, I'm figuring out some of this stuff with the recording and editing, you know, being at the house on my own now, um, I'm thinking about doing a second show to get into uh, a little bit more entertainment. But one thing that I wanted to touch base on is. Um, it looks like we're getting close to the return of actually two entertainment bits. Um, we're getting ready to, for the, the return of, uh, stars, uh, the star series power. We're one of the better performing, um, series on all of, uh, cable television or, uh, just in general in, uh, amongst television, TV series, um, with Amari Hardwick, uh, Joseph Sikora, Notori Norton, and uh, 50 Cent or Curtis Jackson. Um, it's on its way back for, I believe, what is it, season five, maybe? I want to say it's season five. I'm going to give it a short rope. Me and Damian Adams briefly touched on it, and he's he's excited about it and uh, is still interested in the show. I'm going to be honest, man. I, I think it's really, uh, it's really clumsy. I think uh, what I'm starting to see is that the the writers really don't know how to get into the the street side, you know, the real mechanics of you know a street organization, and I think that's one thing they've they've strayed away from. Um, I think even Ghost has mentioned it a couple times that we're we're built really just to handle distribution. Um, we're not re and and to move quickly, you know. He doesn't doesn't really have a a, a large uh, street team whatsoever, and uh, I don't know. I mean that that helped it be different from you know something like the wire. It, it helped it not go down the same road as that. And then I think you know they've obviously devoted so much time to him and Angela, you know their love affair and whatnot. And so uh, it's kind of just been able to present itself as this slick, you know, story in, in, in a major metropolitan area. And um, I don't know. I mean, I don't need to see all of the street stuff necessarily, but, uh, you know, I just feel like the show's kind of lost itself. And uh, if they don't want to stay kind of uh, – on task or on message with what, to, with something that's believable and interesting and have a little bit of uh, complexity to it, then I'm just not interested in it. And um, I'm going to go into it a little bit more uh, once the show starts, some of my issues with it. But even I think you got to think back to season three when, um, you know, when the wait staff at Truth took down a paramilitary unit, you know, right under their noses. This is a, a unit that had everything locked down for like 
six episodes or so and really had Ghost on the ropes. And uh, all of a sudden, we have like three ladies in heels with uh, servers, uh, platters with guns underneath them. And they're marching, you know, a bunch of uh, highly armed, uh, highly trained killers back to the back to uh, get rid of, you know, the problem that plagued the uh, ghost all that season. So it was real to me. It was real cheesy how they did away with that. And uh, that was kind of where I started really parting ways with the show. And then um, last year, you know, last season, I had my issues with it. And it, it, it's okay to tune in. And, and for me, I mean, it, I just moved it down to where, you know, I can catch it when I catch it. I don't necessarily need to watch it that morning on demand or some of the different ways that we can get to. Uh, you know, I, I think it even leaked. Was it last year when it leaked or the year before that it le- leaked and all the episodes were online or the last three or four episodes were out there early? Uh, you know, I wouldn't like I said, it's, it's kind of been downgraded for me to where I really wouldn't go to, through too much trouble. I wouldn't disrupt my Sunday or my weekend uh, to really check out power at this point. But th- the main thing before I move on, uh, the main thing to me is. Per, another perfect example is how the hell is Dre the man now and 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 being distro or, or I think is the term they've been using and it takes so it either takes some muscle or some bodies you got to have a team uh, which I think he did meet with some of his old street team guys at, at the end of the end of last season when he started moving into being the man but for him to deal with the organization the 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 real plug you know the uh the latin people um i don't know if they were dominican or mexican whatever uh but the group the brother and sister they really you know are bringing all the the uh the weight from from down south how do you have that meeting and you have no money i mean you've just been a guy halfway running a club and you know doing as much as what ghost put on him to handle but he's not a guy walking around with several millions you know millions of dollars buried in his backyard and that was just that just moved too quickly for me but again power is really not about detail it's really not about um sharp storytelling and whatnot is is being handled very loosely and uh now we see um you know the big three has formed with Kanan, uh tommy and ghost being uh together to make a run at paying uh dre back who like i said i just don't understand how he became the man to begin with but it is what it is uh for those that want to tune in i think it kind it starts next sunday i believe will be uh episode one um, the other entertainment note, I got to get ready to get out of here cause I got to get on the road tomorrow, but I don't know if you saw the Kendrick Lamar video where he had, a, um, a younger white female, I don't know, she might've been mid twenties, invited her up on stage to rap along with him and, uh, a couple of lines of bars into the course. What do you know? They run across the N word, and the young lady proceeds to sing the, or rap the N word very casually. And uh, the DJ starts to, you know, fade the music out. And Kendrick, you know, gets involved, and uh, he handled it very, um, you know, professionally. He is what he is at this point. But um, you know, they had a conversation. She said she was sorry about it. Um, but she kind of was like, Hey, you know, I'm cool. You know, I thought everybody was cool here. Uh, but the people in the audience are calling her the B word and, you know, starting to boo and, you know, making threatening, uh, comments towards her and whatnot. And, um, you know, this, this was on okay player, uh, hip hop DX and all of the different hip hop uh pages on Instagram and then it was you know the video was also on Facebook and whatnot. And um 
I'm not even going to get into my full point tonight, but I just think the usage of the word, the reliance on the N-word at this point in hip-hop is just completely out of control. And uh, if we're not going to say anything about Takashi 6 9 using the word, I just really don't know how, uh, you know, I, I really don't understand how black people can really be, uh, expect people to know what the rules are, the unwritten rules, if you will. And um, it's just another interesting thing to observe out here in the world is, uh, you know, every, every it seems like every year, you know, the essences of the world, the BET, which I don't know who goes to BET.com anymore, but uh, Black Enterprise, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, the black media be beyond just the hip hop uh, magazines and whatnot. But every year it seems like some group of doctors or some higher level journalists, you know, you know, tr more traditional journalists have to write a story about the status of the N word for, uh, you know, the current time period and whatnot. And so it'll be interesting to see if this one, you know, last year, what's his name kicked it off? Um, uh, Bill Maher with, uh, his usage of, uh, you know, a, a, a term on uh, his show where he said the N-word might have been with the ER on the end and whatnot. But, um, so it'll just be interesting to see if this kicks off this year's discussion so that we can all know that nobody knows. And, you know, like I said, I, I just feel like uh, too many rappers continue to carelessly throw the word around. And um, it's just awkward to me that you would step back and then and then expect non-black people to not be using this word when they're wrapping it in the car and they're wrapping it in their house and whenever else and then when I we all get together you know I'm supposed to not say though say this word and um I'll get into my 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 thought a little deeper on another on on another note but um hey, I'm gonna get out of here I'm going to get into the uh, the segments for this week. Like I said, first up would be Damian Adams um, of uh, The Real Deal with Damian Adams. Be sure to check him out, his podcast and YouTube channel. He's also covering the Phoenix Mercury right now uh, for three-point conversion. So that's a real dope development development for him as I see him uh, doing some of his pregame stuff on his Instagram page. So salute to him on you know making the most of that opportunity. And then, um, like I said, secondly on tonight's episode will be uh, Tiffany Daniels um, of uh, Wire Promotions out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And then we'll close it out with Luki Cattell of uh, ITR Boxing. So uh, I'm not going to come back on the opposite side of this. I, I think I'm about three, maybe four episodes away from really tightening up my format and uh, getting this editing stuff down and being, being able to quickly... Uh, put these uh, put my podcast together and kind of build back up to what you know my uh, quality level is on the production and uh, you know adding some different flavor to the show and whatnot but um, maybe maybe about three to four I stumbled across a few editing tricks here uh, on as I'm putting this one together so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, expanding you know my uh, my bag of tricks to like I said, to make this more efficient and uh, keep my energy up when I'm trying to do a podcast and, and have like 70% of my brain concerned with sound quality and, you know, not uh, recording over some call that I just did, which I almost did with one with Damian Adams uh, segment. So uh, anyway, you know how I end every show. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Peace. This is TalkLoudRadio.com. Talk loud.
Loud Radio podcast combines sports, nerds, and pop culture with the Pay Me No Mind show. Just down to earth sports and entertainment. The Clash of the Nerds Let's Podcast Show. The latest movies and video games with a dash of comedy. And the Armchair Fantasy Show. Eight Sleep Fantasy Sports. Find Talk Loud Radio on all the major podcast services like iTunes and Stitcher at TalkLoudRadio.com and streaming on the Going For Two app for iOS and Android. Talk Loud Radio, where sports, nerds, and pop culture collide. I want to welcome to the show, I think first time, but a very special guest, uh, one of my favorite boxing people in my area or my region, but I just want to, I, I want to welcome to the show, Tiffany Daniels. Thank you for having me, Woods. No problem. I appreciate you taking your time tonight. I hate it, uh, you know, that I kind of waited to the last minute because I know you guys have an event going on, uh, but, you know, we'll, I, we'll get it up there with some time and, um, you know, I just like, since I won't be there Friday night, it was kind of the best that I could do. I appreciate it. But let's jump into it. Um, For anybody, uh, you know, just listening to this episode, Tiffany um, has covered boxing before. I think she still does from time to time. Um, has done some stuff with uh, Inside the Ropes with uh, Lukey. And, um, you know, works around the scene in Cincinnati where there's tons of boxing, um, tons of boxing on and also check her out on fight night, you know, with some of her different commentary on Facebook and whatnot. So, you know, she is pretty knowledgeable and she has an event, you know, she's playing a role, uh, in in an organization that's holding an event Friday. So we'll get to that last, um, but for starters, um, I hope this isn't uh, st- stereotypical or sexist or whatever, but since I had you on, I just wanted to get your opinion on, um, you know, your thoughts on the progress of uh, the women's uh, side of boxing that's going on right now. Well, I think that um, the success of Clarissa Shields has really played a big part in getting women, you know, on major networks, um, which hasn't usually typically happen she's actually headlined her own car a couple of times so i think she is really the driving success right now um and sometimes i think it's bad uh, not just for boxing but women in general because you know we're women we can't sometimes you have children or you take time out to have kids and you can't um commit to the that boxing lifestyle that that male fighters can do and sometimes honestly uh, the box community, they don't treat, sometimes they don't treat the women as, as, with the respect that they deserve, I believe. With that being said, you know, some of the criticism, I know you visit some of the uh, forums or, you know, you hear some of the, uh, you know, some discussions in different circles and whatnot, but with someone like Clarissa being out front and some of the women, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had uh, Kaylee Reese and, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on her name, Cecilia Breakus, you know, we're on the co-main event for the HBO card with Triple G, but um, primarily a lot of the criticism that I see aimed at Clarissa because she does kind of have the spotlight on her. Uh, what's your reactions to some of the criticisms about her or just the criticism of, uh, you know, her skill set and whatnot? Or do you just not pay any attention? I actually, I actually don't pay attention because have, if you had any interaction with Clarissa Shield, she she could take care of herself. To be honest with you, <laughs> like she she don't hold no punches and she'll go in there and fight a man. And that's kind of like you know, I think a lot of the women, her included, um, like uh, Chevelle Hallback, Chevy Hallback. Uh-huh. She was a professional fighter, and she's a little bit older. She's trying to get a, her game back on point, and she was willing to even fight a dude. You know, she wanted to fight anybody just to be on 
on TV just to be a part of something. So I think um, a lot of the, the top women, some of the women out here, they don't have that meek personality. Look at like Ann Wolf. They don't have that type of meek personality. Man, they rough and tough. They can handle themselves. So I usually just read the commentary just to see what the comments that that, that like uh, Clarissa will make because she usually can handle herself. Yeah, I think um, she has the right uh, personality, you know, in the uh, she's great. She, yeah, she seems to she seems to let a lot of the criticism slide off of, uh, you know, her shoulders and whatnot. and doesn't seem to carry it too much. I do see her defend herself sometimes, but I, I, I never see her really uh, get too uh, nasty about it. It's just like, look, I'm living my life and, and I'm achieving the things that I'm setting out to do and if you don't like it whatever exactly exactly she she does have a a great attitude towards you know her career and what she focused on in the city of Flint now do you think do you think that um it's kind of just the, the the women's game is just kind of in a weird place because you've had it's like we have an older guard that's been out there in the game, just like, you know, Kaylee Reese, who's been out there, but that exposure and opportunities weren't really there the last several years, but now there is this movement and it just seems like it's this older guard, uh, that may have taken some, you know what I'm saying? I feel like it's some, some, uh, some female fighters who may have taken some chances just trying to, like you just mentioned with that last female and, and so, hold back? yes, and have some of these records that aren't pristine records because they went and fought in a different country or they went and fought, you know, in some upside down situation. And now that more energy and attention is, is being directed towards the game, it's kind of like we're finding out who the players are on a week by week basis. Right. I kind of, I, I kind of think of it as like a, the type of analogy. If you go to, let's say high school sports, if you go to a high school basketball game, on a Friday night or a football game, you see all the support that these the, the male football team or male basketball team get. But if you go to a girls' basketball game, there's nobody there. You know, like in, in sports where it's t- typically male-dominated, it's hard-pressed to get that support. Um, and it, it doesn't matter who your manager is. It doesn't matter what the marketing is. You got to get the promoters to believe in you. And that's just that's half the battle. You can be the best boxer out there. If the promoter doesn't believe in you, they're not going to promote you. They feel like they can't get people in seats if they're female. And so, like you said, like the wave that's going now, that's kind of breaking that ceiling. And I think that if there's any women out here that, that that's boxing, now's the chance. Take, a, take the opportunity to try to get a fight, to try to get the card, um, because right now we, we got a good wave of that going on. Right. And I think um, I'm not the biggest MMA fan, but I will say over the last couple of years, I have checked into more of the women's action. Um, um, yeah. So I'm Ronda talking, Rousey, thanks to her. Right. I mean, if she was another trailblazer and someone that was able, a figure that was able to bring in the masses and headline some shows and whatnot. But it just seems even once other females got involved, um, uh, it just seems like their fights have been more, um, I don't know. I've enjoyed them more just from the, the use of skill and technique that I see versus some of the, on the men. In my opinion, I saw a lot of men starting to do more striking and I just felt like if, if I'm a watch guy striking then I just rather watch boxing. Whereas I see on the women's right. side, I thought I just saw a lot more, uh, skill, you know, in the, in the, in the MMA side of, uh, you know, di- or MMA disciplines. So I've enjoyed that. Do you think that, that the handling of, uh, some of the, uh, the women in MMA or UFC, do you think that's kind of along with Clarissa's, uh, ascension or rise to the forefront? Do you think the women, maybe for Showtime and some of the networks getting involved that seeing some of the reaction to the females in, um, MMA, it was somewhat of an incentive or, or, you know, for them to get involved with, you know, female boxers. I think so. I think, like you said, Ronda Rousey was a trailblazer, a cyborg, and all the success that the MMA got from having those cards. Ronda, she, she did, I don't know how many 
car she headlined. Then she had, you know, the UFC, uh, that show. I'm not sure whether it's the Ultimate Fighter show. Oh, yeah, yeah, she yeah. headlined one of those. True. And um, I think, like you said, they use that. They see how much success they got and how much view- viewership they received. I think that they did kind of say, okay, maybe we need to rethink this whole, you know, thing with women and maybe we got to see what's next. And when Clarissa won that gold medal again, that was a perfect segue into get somebody that's great coming off something substantial. Let's use her. Okay. Um, they didn't pull nobody else up because it's, it's been great fighters, like all over California, like Ava Knight. She's great. And she kind of just like, she hadn't been getting the fight. She hadn't been doing that thing. She kind of went off and had a family. So, you know, they got to kind of, I think age plays a lot of it too. You know, you, you have to stop and have a family. You got to stop and do all that stuff. And are you going to go back, you know, once you start that? So I think it's like they have a time limit. Right, right. Like I said, I, I think now just the same way that we saw an inflow or an influx of, uh, you know, females on the MMA, MMA side once uh, Rousey started, uh, you know, headlining, I think it's the same thing now that it's been the, it's been all of these uh, females in gyms across the country the last couple of years. And, and now, um, you know, the opportunities are starting to happen. And I, I think, um, you know, we'll start to see them included in the cards more. And, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a little moment. Like you said, it's a way for it right now. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I think it's a great time because I think part of the reason why they can't get fights is because people don't know who they are. You know, you could see people, you know, you could see fighters on ESPN all day long on other on other networks, but the women fighters they don't get a lot of exposure, you know, television wise. So as long as they can get them out there, people can start remembering who they are, see how they fight and, and get to be a part of their their journey. So I think that that's a good thing that we continue to to add to that wave of women boxing. Right. Um, we'll come back to that, um, you know, maybe before the uh, the big car for Clarissa at the end of next month, maybe before uh, that happens, you know, I'll get you back on and uh, we'll we'll break that down or, or dig into that card a little bit. Yeah, maybe we can try to get her to come on the show. I've got a few emails and, and – uh, <laughs> You know, I am's out there for it, but um, you know, I'm pretty low on the list. But uh, I'm I'm gonna be persistent about it. Yeah, I'll call. I'll, I'll send a message to her. And say let's let's talk about it. Right. Um. So let's look at it. Um. You know, what's your thoughts on what 2018 is doing for the sport in general? Um. Coming on the heels of a you know a phenomenal 2017. Uh. You as like I said, is covering the sport before and from time to time. Um, how do you think 2018 is doing in following up 2017? Well, I think initially I was real excited about 2018. We had some great fights uh, that so far, but then we also had fights that just kind of fell apart or just didn't happen. You know, like uh, the rematch of Canelo and, and Triple G, and you kind of got to wait it out. But I think so far um, 2018 is shaping up to be another great win for boxing fans uh with, we got great some great fights with the absence of uh canelo and triple g uh, the rematch of that what's been your highlight so far well um i thought last week uh on saturday which i wasn't expecting and i'm gonna be honest with you i try not to be biased but for some reason i just do not care for Bobby jack and I just don't know what it is. And I can't get past it, but I thought that he did a hell of a job uh, last weekend uh, in that fight against uh, Adonis Stevenson. And I thought he I thought he won the fight. Um, also, Jorge Linares, I thought he did a great job against Lomachenko, even though he was a bigger guy. Um, I thought he did good. I thought it was it was a good fight, but Lomachenko is probably one of the most phenomenal fighters I, I've ever witnessed. Okay. So um, that was a great fight. Okay, um, that's that's interesting. Um, you know, being, I mean, you, you know, to have a, a, a strong opinion on Badu Jack. I mean, he's, I give him credit because he's probably the only guy in the game right now who's fought like six 
straight uh, world champions or former world champions. I right. Be- I believe he's at six. So I admire a guy. I mean, I, I, I'm a little uncertain of, uh, you know, what his level of elite eliteness might be at this point. And, right. And I mean, I know he had, he just got his fourth draw. Um, I do think he did enough to win that fight, but I'm, I'm not too mad at the uh, the majority draw. The decision, yeah, I wasn't I'm not, mad about. The yeah, I'm decision. not too mad about it, but I I, I think any time that a fighter kind of seeds a certain portion of a fight, I wonder. Uh, you just take a lot of control out of your own hand, but he, I think he had that that game plan for a good reason because I think Stevenson's left hand just is that lethal early on in a fight. Right. Right. But, I mean, you just leave yourself such a, a slim, um, you know, mar- error for margin or margin for error, you know, when you got to, st- um, you know, be perfect on the back half of a fight. So, anyway, um, I didn't really want to dig into that, but I do want to know, you know, <laughs> what's, what's something that, uh, you know, what's something that you'd be eager for for the, the second half of 2018? Let me think. Um I would really love to see um, and somehow make it happen. I know Mikey Garcia is fighting up now. Um, I'm not sure exactly what weight he is because he's kind of picking and choosing. Uh, but I would really like to see a fight made with him and Lomachenko. Okay, okay. Um, now I really, really like to see that happen. That's a great call, and I think that's a uh, that probably be in everybody's top three, you know, of a short list. Um, now you know uh, Garcia and Easter Junior, I believe, is finalized for July twenty eighth. I want to say out in um, Los Angeles, maybe at Staples Center. I, I think that was just announced yeah. within the last week or so. And it's a possibility that uh, you know f- to close out the year that the winner of that you know could face the winner of uh, Lomachenko on his next fight, which was I think rumored to be uh Beltron was rumored to be a strong candidate for his opponent. So uh That'd be a good fight though. That's tough fight for both. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Definitely. I think uh lightweight is, is very exciting right now and um I don't want to dig into my Garcia Easter Junior uh take right now, but that's an interesting <laughs> that's an interesting fight. And one thing very interesting about that is obviously with you know, uh, Garcia winning eight to nine rounds against Adrian Broner in their fight. Now for someone that fights on the about billions uh, roster to face the guy, right. it, you know, that's an interesting storyline in that, in that whole fight. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very interesting fight. The, the whole, um, the style, the um, Easter's tall too. So um, that's, this is going to be interesting to see. But, you know, I'm from Ohio, so, you know, I'm rolling with Easter. Despite whatever I feel, I got to go with the home team. <laughs> my, my opinion on that one is probably not going to be too popular in Ohio, but I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to hold on to it for, for a second longer before I put it out there. Um, so we got that the second half of 2018. Um, but let's, So let's jump into it, um, you know, with your event this Friday night. Um, Wyatt Promotions, I believe, is, is is heading that up, organizing that. But it's a card going down this Friday night, and I'll let you get into the particulars. Uh, you know, you can introduce anybody listening to what's going on Friday. Well, I want everybody to show up. Uh, Wyatt Promotions, what we're doing, and what the plan is we want to – basically bring boxing back to Cincinnati. Cincinnati got a, a, a hell of a lot of talent. Um, and I think we got away with keeping our fighters busy. If you just don't know, um, um, what's the little kid's name? AJ, he just won oh, yeah. National Golden Glove. He got that. So, you know, we always got great waves of fighters. But anyway, we started at Wyatt Promotions Friday Night Fight Series. So we want to have Friday Night Fight Cards. We had a first card back in February. Um, and we got the, the second card in that series on Friday, May the 25th at Cincinnati Music Hall. So we had the first one down at the Radisson, and we sold it out, standing room only. We had to give people their money back because it just wasn't enough space. We didn't we didn't know what to expect, basically, uh, as far as support. So we worked really, really hard um, to secure a bigger venue, 
so that we can have more people come out and support support these local fighters and they're all professionals. Um, and Daniel Long is going to be headlining that card. Um, really tough fighter. He got a knockout in the last card. And uh, then we'll also have another card coming up in August. So it'll be like the last Friday in August. I'll get you the, the correct date. And that's going to be at the uh, Kentucky Convention Center. So we got these bigger venues because we want people to come out and support the fighters. And um, it was a great turnout the last time. And we're going to have a, at least five to six um, fighters on the card, hopefully more. Um, it starts at 9 o'clock, first bell. So make sure if you have somebody that you want to see, you got to be there at 9 o'clock because it's starting on time. Uh, I know uh, Mike Jones, his mother missed this fight, uh, the first card. Okay. So that's basically what we're doing. Uh, we want to continue on with the Friday Night Fight Series. We're going to see how the first three go and want to try to keep our fighters busy. And the thing about Wyatt Promotions is that uh, they really want to make a change in the, in the Cincinnati boxing community. I mean, we, we struggle here trying to get commission uh, because of some of the stuff that was going on with other companies. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, they're with, they help fund Real Deal Boxing have a, so that they can have a home so that the kids can go to the nationals and also they want to invest in fighters who invest in themselves so if you don't want if you're not investing in yourself they're not going to invest in you basically uh so that's that's the whole premise of everything we got going i hope that people can come out we have the weigh-in on thursday at jack casino it's free and open to the public if you're 21 and up so I'll see you at 6 30 and then see you at the fight on friday night nine o'clock all right and i it's not really a plug for myself but um i just want to shed light on what you guys have have going what you guys have going on what you're attempting to build and you know i just think it's a great opportunity for people to see live uh boxing action and to understand you know i see so many guys in the barber shop uh talking about you know the fights they can't get to and the fights they won't get to and I just think it's such a great value, you know, to uh, to go to some of the local cards and see, um, you know, and it's it's been now you don't you guys haven't had any heavyweights on the card yet, but I think you had some cruisers or some light heavyweights on the first one back in. Oh no, that wasn't you. That wasn't you. Uh, no. But uh, but like I said, I think you guys are building something. It was a phenomenal night the last time out. And uh, you can go to roundbyroundboxing.com and uh, check out my article on it. Uh, I don't really, I'm not asking you to do it to give me a click or anything. It was because it's already done what it did, but um, it is just a great way to kind of um, familiarize yourself with Wire Promotions and everything that happened back in, um, was it January? It was February. February, February. But, it was February, yeah. But you can get an idea of, um, what what you're trying to do and one thing that i will say with um with you guys that um why it was pushing you know the safety you know feel safe at the event um i felt like uh everybody act was acting professional you know fights were happening on time uh you know it was just all around it was it was worth anybody that gave some money to the event it was worth your money it was worth it. And, and where else can you go see a professional fight for $25, $28? Uh, ring size seats was like 75 bucks the last go round. You can get tables, you know, for $500 and it's eight seats, you know. So it's a great deal. I think anybody who would like to learn more about boxing and not just Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, those big names, they should come out and see the local cars, see who's fighting in your city. See who that next big superstar is, because it all happens here. Right now, it so, is, I know I got a. I was talking with Wyatt, and you know, he told me that there were some VIPs that were planned. Um, anybody committed to showing up that people might, you know, nationally known athletes or, or fighters? That I don't know. I'll probably count on if anybody for sure. Probably Rashi Warren. Um, Rashi Warren should probably be there. Um, and he usually comes to the weigh-ins and everything. So if you ever want to see some professional boxers, come on down. He's there. There's usually a, a, a good mix of people 
Uh, last time Adrian Broner came out, Robert Easter came out. Um, so that was that was good. And um, also Rashad Holloway. You familiar with Rashad Holloway? I think so. He was from Cincinnati. He was professional. Uh, he went. He lives down in Vegas now, and he was there. Okay. So it was quite a few uh, heavy hitters there the last go round. I'm expecting the same this time. Okay. Um, we're not trying to not mention any names, but you know some of these guys are just in their fourth, fifth, sixth, you know maybe eighth fight and whatnot, uh, and and the card is still being put together. Uh, we're you know we're not trying to hide that uh, these things are very fluid, you know as you're trying to get them together, but they're still working hard. And like I said at the end of the night, uh, a night out with live action in front of you is still going to be worth your twenty eight or, or thirty dollars or whatever uh, the price prices are but uh feel free to go on to the uh pnmm facebook page and you know i just put up the uh the advertisement there i will say one um you know one downside of this event is that a local fighter uh santino was gonna turnbo was gonna be on there who's a uh light heavy is, you know he's a cruiserweight right yeah i think he's a I'm pretty sure he's a cruiserweight. Yeah, I think cruiserweight. Uh, but he was. I'm pretty sure he's cruising. He was on the uh, the pictures that went out, the posters or flyers and whatnot that went out initially. But it looks like he announced uh, the other night that he won't be fighting on there, uh, unfortunately. But that would have been a chance to see, you know, some of the bigger guys fight. But uh, one thing that I do want to say before we move on is just that, as Tiffany just mentioned, you know, trying to respond to the the demand for the action and to go ahead and invest in moving things to a bigger uh venue um you know that's a risk for you guys to take but you're trying to get fights for your fighters and and keep the guys busy and um you know and to support the fans that want to come out and see it so it'd be a big disappointment for there to be a major drop off, you know, in, 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 in the, uh, the turnout that we saw back in February. Absolutely. So you that can will be a big drawback. Yeah. So you can check out again, you can check out Tiffany Daniels on Facebook. She has the, uh, you know, the posters up on her, her page. Like I said, you can also check them out on the pay me no mind, uh, Facebook page. And I'll probably do some other, uh, maybe something else on Instagram or something. Unfortunately, I won't be in the building this Friday night because I got to uh, go out of town for a family engagement. But, um, you know, I do hate to miss it because I, I, I really like to cover the local stuff as much as I like to, you know, go to some of the bigger fights that I've been to. So uh, I just wanted to thank Tiffany for coming on tonight and, um, you know, chopping it up with me a little bit about boxing in general and then to, uh, like I said, to shed some light on the event. Um, is Scylla still involved with the car at this point, or is is that one of the ones that's kind of a t kind of touchy at this point? Which one? Bubakar Scylla. Scylla. I I don't know. Okay. I, okay. He, I was told he was, but he's saying no. So I'm hoping so. Okay. Um, like I said, I don't want to uh high. I mean, uh, get into any of the negativity or you know take away anything from the event, regardless of uh what the final lineup it is. It is a chance to see five to seven fights that will be pretty exciting. And uh, like I said, it's only $30 or something. So um, again, what's the prices one more time before we get out of here? Tickets start at twenty eight fifty. That's where the lowest tickets. And then there are VIP seating and then table. The tables are $500, but you will have to call um, down to Wyatt Promotions to see if there's actually any tables still left available because I know they were selling out. They were selling out rows. So make sure you get your tickets quick. And you can get your tickets uh, either at the Aronoff or Music Hall box, box offices or you can call down to Wyatt Promotions and we can hook you up. You got the number handy or? To Wyatt. To Wyatt. Well, for Wyatt Promotions? Yes. Let me get it for you. It is. 513-225-2917. All right. Um, thanks again for coming on tonight. Like I said, uh, I don't know what I, I was having a, a brain uh, fart or something to not get you on like two a <laughs> week ago or something. But um, like I said, I feel really bad that I can uh, be in attendance 
um, you know, this this time around. But um, and I'm I'm struggling to find somebody to send in my place. But um, anyway, well, let me know either way. Okay. But we got another one coming up in August, so I save you. Um, I want you there if you can if you can come. August is no problem, no problem. Uh, th- Great. Any, any last words before we get out of here? Well, I just want to see you guys there, and if you show up at the fight, make sure you come and say hello to me. I'll be the four foot eleven small small person walking around like a crazy person. <laughs> and now, <laughs> just, just so people know, what is your role exactly in um, Wired Promotions? I'm the public relations coordinator. Okay. So I handle a lot of the media and the things that happens that way and things that we send out to the press. Okay. Okay. All right. Hey, well, look, thanks a lot. Thanks for your, uh, you know, your, your thoughts on all the other boxing stuff and, uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Have a good night. You too. I want to welcome back to the show. I'm going to keep this very casual. Good friend. Uh, he's had me on his podcast once or twice, and uh, I think he's been on mine once. But I want to link up with Mr. Lukey from, uh, and I'm messing, I don't want to mess up your last name, but uh, Lukey from Inside you, the Ropes. You can mess it up. I mess everybody's name up. It's, <laughs> it totally was, is just karma. Oh, no problem. No problem. So but everybody knows Lukey from Inside the Ropes. Correct. Yeah, I hope so. I like. I mean, that would be nice. Like, I'd like to believe that. So, I'm gonna say yes. Good. Hey, uh, what you listening to right now, music, music wise, man? Before we get into the boxing, I think I think I'm still on the same because you gotta remember, I'm a little bit older. So I've got I got like a set playlist. I will say I went on a road trip and I was listening to Plug Walk. I know that's not a cool song, but I was listening to Plug Walk. I can't understand how the plug talk. I don't even know what And I'm song listening to a little bit of that Meek Mill uh, 1942 flow. Okay. I haven't heard either one of those. Well, I, I really recommend the plug walk, but don't listen to the verses. Just hear the chorus. <laughs> who Who is the artist for plug walk? Is that the name of the group or is that the song? That's the song. It goes plug walk. And then the next thing is he says, but I don't understand how the plug talk. Oh, so who's the artist? I don't know. Okay. It's like one of these young kids that's like looks way different than I looked when I was a young kid. Yeah, yeah. It's not somebody with a tattoo on their face, is it? I can't do the tattoo on their face. I can't I can't do that, especially if it does not look like you hit the gym regularly. Gotcha. If you do not look like you hit the gym and you got a face tattoo, I can't do it. Gotcha. And I also can't handle rappers that say blicky and sticky and like weird words. I can't do it. Yeah, I was listening to, I can't even say I was listening. I got a little curious in the, the lead up to the Broner and um, and uh, Vargas fight when the 6ix9ine Takashi dude came into the picture. And so I looked up his album and it was like 11 or 12, maybe 13 songs. I don't know. But the names of the songs weren't even words. I don't think any of them were. And I was just like, I just had no interest in checking out any of the music because I, I wouldn't even know how to pronounce the name of the song. Let me go on a rant on this. So, uh, like, uh-oh. I can't listen to Takashi 6 9 because I'm, like, 32, 33. I always forget how old I am. And I just feel like a parent. Like, I feel like Takashi 6 9 needs to get put on timeout. Like, he feels like a child to me that's misbehaving. Like, it's not enjoyable to me as an adult. I don't know if I'm in a minority, but I just hear a kid, that, like, he's acting bratty and he needs to get sent to his room. Well, see, I'm like 10 years older than you, so I'm I'm even farther than you on that. Whereas he just sounds like an angry young guy, uh, just mad for no reason and can't really figure out, you know, any solutions to his problems that he's like um, imagined that he had. I don't know, man. I, I don't even want to waste time. Now we're getting way too, now we're getting too deep, but let me, let me try to drop a gem on him. Like what's a, what's a real good song. Like I've been listening to the meat mill. That's a good song. 
what's a song out there? You know a song that's like kind of an underground Bay Area song that I've been enjoying? What's that? That probably not a lot of people are listening to is this guy named Shady Nate has a song called Shots Fired. And I've been listening to that one. So like someone wants like kind of like an obscure album cutty-ish. You might not enjoy it. You might like it. That's a good one. Okay. Okay. Hey, well, let's get into some of this yeah, boxing, sure. man. We probably just lost everybody that might have found their way to this to, to this link right here. But uh, thanks for coming on tonight. I just wanted to know what you had going on. I'm, I really didn't even write out any uh, questions for you this time. I guess what I want to start, uh, what was your thoughts on Linares? And uh, I know you've discussed it on your, you know, on your platforms. But what were your thoughts on uh, Linares and Loma, Lomachenko, a couple weeks well, ago? First and foremost, I consider you a friend, so you never gotta you never gotta worry about nothing. Um, I'll always give you my utmost time because I I value just being able to communicate with you. I I really enjoy being able to talk boxing with you, and you seem like a great, terrific person. And I appreciate all the time uh, you put into boxing, and you make great stuff. So appreciate I want to put you over right there, and then. I'm going to segue with the put you over into my thoughts on Linares and Loma. And uh, I thought it was a good fight. I thought the commentary was truly tough to listen to. It felt like ESPN kind of maybe sent out a special memo to the broadcasters to kind of hit some key points on Loma and not talk about Linares. Wow. I thought Linares did well. He actually did a lot better than I thought. Uh, Lomachenko did exactly what I kind of thought. I thought he'd stop Linares around the ninth or 10th round. It kind of felt like a ceiling fight to me for Lomachenko, where this is about as high as Lomachenko can go. Maybe he can go to 40, but this does feel like kind of where he's going to start to look ordinary-ish, where the size is going to affect him. Because I know I've heard rumors that fight week weeks be, before the Jason Sosa fight he was walking around at 132 pounds oh wow so we're talking of a guy who weeks before his fight a few years ago was under the lightweight limit we're not talking about a massive man here right i think he's a very talented fighter i think he does a he's a once in a generation fighter in terms of what he's doing i think a lot of people hate on him because they they didn't really follow amateur boxing and a lot of boxing fans feel like they don't want to be told what to like, but I think he's pretty incredible. Let's, let's keep it a buck. Um, a lot of, a lot of black guys that I talk to and a lot of black fighters do, that I talk to, uh, kind of write him off a little bit and, and his movement and, and, and some of his, you know, his, uh, physical attributes and whatnot. Do you think that's is is that kind of consistent for you that a lot of uh black fighters seem to disregard or dis, dis discount his ability? Well, I think that that's mainly because look at Terence Crawford. Terence Crawford in my opinion is equally as talented as Lomachenko and he has as impressive of a resume. Like people forget Crawford is a lightweight champion a super lightweight champion, and he's more than likely going to be a welterweight champion. He's going to be a three-weight division champion, the same exact thing as Lomachenko. The only thing he doesn't have is two gold medals. But beyond that, he's a very, very impressive professional boxer who's probably going to be a three-division world champion who fought Victor Postal. He fought Yuri Okis Gamboa. He fought undefeated fighters that were schoolyard bullies that people were not eager to fight. And he beat them up so bad that people thought that those guys sucked. That's how bad Crawford beat him up. And you don't really hear people ranting and raving about Crawford. So I think a little bit of the frustration from maybe the bo- the black boxing community comes from the fact that you have guys like Earl Spence and Terrence Crawford, and people are quick to kind of write them off. Oh, they're one-dimensional, or oh, they're only athletic. And then they kind of hear the same <clears throat> the same things that they see Crawford doing in Lomachenko, but people are praising every little thing that he's doing. So I think that it, I think there is a bit of frustration that there's a double standard there. Interesting. I I didn't see you going there that direction with that, but that's that's interesting. Okay. Um. But do, <laughs> but do you uh, 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 do you think that 
do you think that his, his his skills are legit though? Like it would take a hell of a fighter to get in there and overcome everything that Lomachenko does in the ring. Because I and I I'll put that in, put that in perspective. I talked with Hank Lundy, and Hank Lundy is what he is. But he just wrote him off that if he came and saw him, it would be no problem. And I'm, I, you know, that might not be the truth. I think a lot of I think Lomachenko is very for real. I think he's one of the. I have a. I don't know if you've heard, but I'll just say it to your listenership. There's four fighters that I view in boxing that are the best boxers, and I can't rank them one to four. I just put them out there for, and they're all in uh, the phases of separation okay. to figure out who they are. But I think it's Lomachenko, Terrence Crawford, Mikey Garcia, and Earl Spence. I think those are the four best boxers in the world, bar none. They're just – they're above everybody else. I think Lomachenko is beyond real. I think that he's an amazing fighter. I think he's a difficult fight for most people. I think that we live in a generation where people don't like to see greatness. People don't really like LeBron for some weird reason. It's like I love watching LeBron. I think he's a great player. I love watching Steph. I love watching Kevin Durant. I love seeing great players. And more often than not, you hear people, like when I go to work, I hear people go, oh, I don't like LeBron. He's not like Jordan. Well, no one, no one at work brought up that he's like Jordan. We just said he's a good player, you know. And with Lomachenko, what I hear about Lomachenko is I always hear, well, he can't beat Mikey. Well, no one brought up that he could beat Mikey. We're just saying he's really good. Like he beat up guys at 26. He beat up guys at 30. You know? So I think part of it's this generation we live in where you – you have fans that don't really want to get behind fighters or, or athletes in general. That's another good point. I mean, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm watching that fight. It did end about the way I didn't, I wasn't for sure that, um, that he'd get the stoppage because I thought Lenars might've been that, that, that big enough to where that didn't happen. But um, it did come later in the fight, so I, I you know, I was a, a round, a couple of rounds short or whatnot. Let, but, let me be rude and interrupt you. See, I, I'll tell you why I knew the stoppage. Lenaris had what I call the training camp from hell. So Lenaris reinvented himself with Ishmael Salas, and he created this whole renaissance. He went to Japan. He went to the UK, beating up everybody. People are calling him pound for pound fighter. All this stuff, right? Reinvents himself. Biggest fight of his career since the DeMarco loss. What does he do? Salas goes to the UK. He goes, ah, I'll just tra get trained by my brother. That, to me, is a huge red flag. Yes. If you're not willing to sacrifice to go with the guy that brought you to the dance. Because Salas is going to David Hay because David Hay is going to pay him millions of dollars. Okay. Linares is not going to pay him the same money. So the guy is going to go where the money is. So at that point, you just have to go – uh, how serious is he? Is he going there to win, or what is he doing? And that's why I was pretty convinced Lomachenko was going to stop him. Was just that decision leading into the fight. Yeah, you you would anytime you do something major like that going into a fight, uh, you know that is uh, something to be very concerned about. But let's let's build off of what you just said with the uh, with there being it looking like there is a ceiling for uh, Lomachenko. I think that's a very fair assessment. But um, do you foresee him hanging around at lightweight and eventually making this fight with Garcia? The Garcia fight's going to be tough based off of the fact that Garcia and uh, top rank have had past transactions with each other or transgressions. Yeah. And they don't, they didn't really uh, end amp amp or on good terms. Right. I won't use a big word because I'm going to stumble over it. I think there's a lot of roadblocks in the way of that fight, but I'll give you some fights that I see potentially happening. Let's go with it. How about Jose Ramirez? How about Manny Pacquiao? Those are the fights that I think are potentially going to happen. Would you throw Tank Davis in there? Or On, like, I'm, I might be in a minority, but I think Tank is really, really good. And I think that anyone that discounts Tank's chances against – like if I was Lomachenko, not to say that he wouldn't beat Tank, but Tank is a fight that I would not be too 
excited about taking because you're basically fighting a guy who has one punch power, is aggressive like Salido, and he's going to fight you more than he's going to box you, but he has the ability to box. And the one thing we've seen about Lomachenko is he's a master boxer, but he's not really like a fighter's fighter. If you get him into a fist fight, he's kind of a little bit confused, if you get what I'm saying. Like, he wants to be able to to kind of mess with you, mock you, play the distance game. He wants to step to the sides, but he doesn't want to really play knuckle up and punch. No, not at all. He doesn't want to be a tough guy, or at least I don't see that from him, because it looks like when people do tough guy stuff to him and they stop boxing, and if he gets out of that game, he's a little like, this isn't how it's supposed to go. And I see Tank as a guy that could potentially knock him out. Because if Tank landed that right hand, he'd knock Lomachenko out that Lenaris landed. Right. My, my only thing, I'm, I'm with you. I think Tank is, 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 a, is an excellent fighter. He is a little younger. Uh, I don't know if he has the physical, the med, you know, the tail of the tape uh, numbers that really are probably would be problematic for uh, as far as having a size advantage reach and length and all of that type of stuff. I don't know if he possesses that, but I think he's a phenomenal puncher and, and, you know, and and the way that he strings his punches together, he seems to be really disciplined in how he finishes off his combinations and just his punch selection. I think all of that is excellent. The only thing I think that's kind of a, a a hamstring for him right now is I think he's a little less uh, responsible defensively, for what he might need to be for that rhythm that Lomachenko can get into during his fights. Yeah, I'm, I think the guys that are going to give him Lomachenko problems are going to be guys that are just fist fighters. And I know that's not like an expression that people probably want to hear, but it's it's guys that just are want to punch, want to punch and want to want to fight. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Um, la- last thought on Lomachenko. Are you interested in seeing the rematch that Gary Russell Jr. wants with Lomachenko? Is that, is that another guy who, uh, in, a, in a second time no. around, you don't like his chances any better? Not at all. It's not even that. To me, it just looked like in the JoJo fight, and I'm probably the only one that saw this, Gary looked like he's slowing down a little bit to me. So Gary's looked better than I feel he looked in that Lomachenko fight in the past. And, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I think Gary needs to fight Oscar Valdez and he needs to fight the Leo Santa Cruz of the world. And if he creates separation with those guys, then he could think about Lomachenko, but he has to, he has to earn kind of like the the title at the division he's at before he can entertain that yeah i uh i was a little that caught my attention for him to it was kind of like korea opening up and and talking to the world all of a sudden uh to hear gary russell kind of being ambitious and throwing out some of the names and going up to maybe as high as 140 i was like where is this coming from from a guy who's only fighting once a year so I was a little excited to hear the guy actually have some some boxing, uh, you know, achievements that he'd still like to aim for because it, it, it seems like it hasn't happened. I mean, Gary's one of the most frustrating boxers because, like, I, I was at a boxing gym, the like, probably the, no, the day of the fight, the day of JoJo's fight a week ago, the Saturday. Everyone in the gym was picking JoJo but me, and it's not because of talent. It's just basically like people were like, is Gary really into this? Is Gary training? Like it's – everyone that knows boxing knows Gary had more skill than JoJo, but it was just people believe JoJo liked boxing more than Gary. And that's how frustrating of a fighter Gary is, that the majority of people that know boxing – lean towards JoJo because of Gary. Yeah, I mean, it's someone, I, I thought it was a no-brainer that Gary, that uh, Russell was going to win, but it was all, oh, look, at Anthony Joshua is at the uh, Houston and Golden State game, courtside. Interesting. I got, a te- I got a text actually this afternoon. Oh, really? From uh, from one of the producers of the, the Warriors 
what's it, the Warriors Rockets game that he yeah. was going to be on the set today. Yeah, he's. Uh, and I was like, that is random. Yeah, they just showed him uh, courtside. I saw where he was getting on a plane or something to LAX, but I didn't really know what he was doing. But uh, yeah, they just showed him on the uh, the broadcast right now. Um, now I completely completely thought I uh, forgot where I was going. Oh, uh, some of the other uh, internet guys, boxing writers that I was talking to, were really just essentially pulling for JoJo because they wanted they're tired of the inactivity of Russell. And, you know, some people had to, came back and said, no, seriously, you know, I think Russ, I'm picking Russell for the fight, but I just want him to lose. Well, that sucks. Like, that's a – to me, it was like a no-brainer, Gary Russell, because I've seen both of the fighters. Right. Live. And JoJo is not a bad fighter, but no, Gary not at all, is one of the no. fastest fighters I've ever seen. And I just knew that if Gary stopped JoJo's that jab, which he did basically in the first round, JoJo would just not be able to throw punches because Gary would just walk backwards. And even if he's not landing, he'd throw eight punches and move. And that's how the fight played out. After the fifth round until the 12th round, JoJo just racked up round, rounds that he lost. Yeah, I agree. Um yeah, I, I mean, I, but JoJo impressed me, man. I, I want to see more. I didn't, I didn't think he could deliver the performance that he did. I mean, he did fall short, obviously, but uh, some, I thought his body work was phenomenal until and and until uh, Russell made that adjustment and kind of took away the success that he was having there. Um, I was really enjoying the work that he was doing underneath. I mean, he's good. He's a good fighter. He's an Olympian, but the thing is. I've seen this in my own life with fighters I know. Once you take that loss, once you realize you might not be that guy, can you wake up and be more motivated? Mm. Good question. Great question. And for JoJo, I really think JoJo thought he was going to beat Gary Russell. And now Gary, JoJo has to get back to camp and realize – some of the things he's believed in life are wrong. And that's the hardest thing for a fighter because fighters have to live these crazy exaggerated lives where they have to believe all types of crazy stuff. Like, wow, this is, um, I'm going to be a world champion. I'm going to be a multimillionaire. I'm going to have a Rolls Royce race. I'm going to have all this crazy stuff. And they have to lie to themselves to put them through living below poverty just to go train, you know, putting their lives on hold, possibly losing marriages because of this. And it's, you really wonder when you lose a world title fight, when you expect to win almost, when you get back into the gym, how are you going to get back into the gym? Because Jojo Diaz goes from a guy who more than likely probably thought he was going to make multi-millions in boxing to maybe fighting Gary Russell is the ceiling of his earning potential as a boxer. And how do you handle that as a human being? That's a hell of a, uh, you know, perspective and, and something to ponder right there. Um, you know, which I don't think fans really, uh, take into consideration when we watch some of these fights and, um, uh, I just feel, uh, you know, to, when I heard Leo Santa Cruz, kind of laying out what his next three or four targets were and Gary Russell Jr.'s name was nowhere in that list. Uh, I was a little disappointed in Santa Cruz, but I mean, I, looking at it from a business perspective, it was like, is is, is Gary Russell Jr. Uh, too much of a risk for not enough reward? Or, or you know, how how is he looking at it at that fight? But it just seems like Frampton, uh, some of the other guys around, you know, at 126 just aren't, jump into uh face uh Gary Russell Jr. Well, I think the other thing too is a lot of boxers are worried about the inactivity. Like, do you trust Gary's going to return in the fall? Oh no, I have no uh I have no faith in uh him actually coming through, you know, and and being more active. Like I said, when I heard him calling, I mean for him to say, you know, he'd be interested in facing uh Gervonta, you know, hearing that a day later, I think I heard it on Twitter or something. You know, I was like, 
damn, you know, is is this what's, is this guy really setting up uh, his exit for you know his his exit out of the game, you know, and, and kind of plotting out his his last two to three fights. Yeah, I don't think Gervonta is a good fight for Gary. I agree, but I mean, I, I would I would watch it though. I mean, I, I would watch that one. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I don't foresee it. That would be a big fight in Maryland. And that's what I was kind of thinking. Just uh, you know, some kind of beltway marketing, some kind of beltway matchup would be the the trend and whatnot. But uh, I, I don't really foresee it happening. But uh, Javante does need some, you know, he he does need some quality opponents. So I mean, I, I I'd watch it. Mm. Yeah, he's um big shot right there by uh, Steph Curry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, it's funny. I live in the Bay Area, and I don't even have the basketball game on. <laughs> well, we know, you know, you know. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to put this show together, so I'm just uh, sitting here. I was glad, like I said, I was glad you uh, hit me back on the, uh, the, the instant message and everything. Uh, oh yeah, hey, of so- course, man. Like, this is my whole life. I worked a full day today, and then I went into the gym and. My buddy was uh, has some injuries. He was going to put me through a real badass workout, and then I did a little push up routine that we call like the uh, I forget if we call it the pill. we call it something, but um, it's basically where you do a push up, you touch your one shoulder, and then you do a push up, you touch the other shoulder, and then you do a clap push up. Oh, okay. And that's one, and you do five of those, and once you get through those, you do some. You do some uh, push-ups as many as you can, and then go from there. You do a straight pull-up, and then you do dips. Okay. And I did okay. that about ten times, do, going through that, and did some more, like some lifts and stuff. Lifted some chest exercises, just some good stuff at the gym. And then I helped a young fighter, taught him some, some body mechanics. Basically, I'm just going. I'm giving you a real long story. I'm just talking through my day, but I'm basically. I'm just saying. Um, I love boxing and if you call me up and I'm free, I'm just going to sit on a phone (laughs) and give you every single opinion until you say I'm done talking to you and I'll just hang up and I'll sit here and I'll eat my gumbo and my little green salad that I got and I'll be on the internet. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, well, look, I do want to take, get some time to put this together, so I'm not going to stay on here much longer, but what I want to do, what I do want to know is, um, you cover the sport very closely and you're always a good plug of information for what's going on 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 the West coast. But, um, sure. As a, you know, being that close to the sport, uh, what's your hopes? Cause 2018 isn't kind of, uh, coming together just yet. I mean, we, we had a pretty solid first half of 2018, but maybe what's uh, one or two of the top developments that you'd like to see to close out the year. I feel like, the way I look at boxing is so different than most people that um, I don't get excited the way the regular fight fans go. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for Andy Vences to return to the ring soon. That'll be great. Um, Gabriel Flores Jr. to get back in the ring two times, June 9th, June the se- July 7th. I'll be at both fights, be there June 9th. Uh, I'd like to see Carlos Balderos a little bit more active. I, I'm really excited to see Teofimo Lopez July 14th in New Orleans. Uh, I'm, I get excited about the young guys. I get excited about Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney, Gervonta Davis, Joseph Adorno. I get excited when those guys fight mid-level guys, start to take the jump, you know, start to build up. Um, in terms of the top-level talent, the big fight that I see out there is Crawford versus Spence. That's something that gets me excited. I think another fight that um, it gets me excited is Vasil Lomachenko versus Jose Ramirez. That's a really good fight. Um, I think Gennady Golovkin versus Jamie Mungi- or Jaime Munguia is probably going to come up in the fall. Canelo versus Spike O'Sullivan is probably going to happen. Um, what else do we have out there? I, I whoever the Charlos fight, that's fun. I, I I just understand the business of boxing, so I don't really, I don't really get my heart set on matchups as much. I follow fighters that I personally know or fighters that I think are interesting to me. 
And I just appreciate their career because what people have to understand is these fighters, there's no, a fight is a fight and you can lose any fight. So you should just appreciate what they got. The, no fighter picks their opponents unless they're extremely powerful. And you just have to appreciate what they're doing with what they got, you know? Um, but I'll, I'll give you one fight that I'd like to see. I'd like to see Michaela Mayer versus Katie Taylor or Michaela Mayer versus Heather Hardy. That's probably an obscure one, but I think that Michaela Mayer has the type of power to possibly cross over like a Ronda Rousey. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see her do it with like maybe Heather Hardy, someone who's worked really, really hard to kind of get a shot to be on like a major network. And I think that would be kind of like a cool transitional fight for Michaela to become a star, beat Heather Hardy probably. And then uh, Michaela and Heather, or uh, Michaela and Katie Taylor could could fight in the future. Um, I don't know. I'm probably rambling. Like maybe Ryan Garcia versus Albert Machado. That probably will f happen on the Canelo card. Um, I think Machado. I don't know who wins that one because Ryan's not really the greatest fighter, but Machado is pretty flawed. Right. Like what? Is, what exactly do you want? Do you want me to guess no, what's going to no, happen, man, or do you no, want man. me just to be like a fan and what what my dream fights no, were? No, that, that what what you just laid out was excellent. I, I uh, honestly, you don't know how much that ties into. I also well, who also will be on this episode is Tiffany Daniels, and so uh, you getting into Michaela May, good friend. Right, right. So Michaela, you mentioning that Michaela kind of ties into part of our conversation. So no, you went right where uh, you you got right into the pocket with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let me just think. If I was a if I was a matchmaker, what would be a fight that I'd really push for? Give me, maybe help me out here. Give me a give me a company. Pretend that I'm a matchmaker for a certain company, and I'll try to make a fight for you. Oh, you mean one like or, just pick any? You mean one of the promoters? Any brand? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me think. Uh, man, I hate talking about promoters. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I I was interested. I'd be interested to see what you would do with Hurd, with Jared Hurd, and where he is right now. Oh, that's easy. Jared Hurd, it's money time. Exactly. So what gets so, him? What what gets him that that bet that the largest bag of his career? Well, here let's see. So because I thought I was going to think about matchmaking developmentals, but um, Jarrett heard. What would I do with him? We could either go. We could either try to go get a unification or a uh, title defense against Michelle Soro, which we could do that back in his hometown. That would be like a hometown title in effect. Um, I'd, I personally, if I was matchmaking, I'd try to avoid Julian Williams. I think Julian Williams is really good. So I, uh, he's his IBF number one. So if it's between Julian Williams and Charlo, I'd probably tell Jared Hurd, let's do the Charlo fight. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Because I think Julian Williams is a really, really good fighter and Charlo's are, are really buzzing. So if you're in a, if you're in a spot where you're probably going to lose either way, you have to side with the one that you're going to make the more money. It sucks to say it like that, but that's the honest truth is, because you're not going to get Jaime Munguia because that belt's that belt's going to be leveraged into something else, and that's just <laughs> they're not going to take the herd fight. That's an HBO belt. They're gonna they're not going to give you that opportunity. So yeah, I think you have to go Charlo. Okay. To be honest with you. Okay, and then last question, last question, because I I don't know who else I could get their input on this, but uh, when I take a look at uh, super middleweight and I'm trying to see, mm -hmm. I'm trying to see what goes on with Caleb plant. Uh, is there a way for him to break through? Because I'm looking at, well, he's the number one contender for the belt. He's the number one contender for the IBF belt. 
But how does his style match up against the 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 volume punchers or you know the 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 the, uh, the bigger punchers such as uh you know Benavides? I mean, his style seem, think, seems to clash with them so much. I think uh, his style versus Benavides works really well. I think his style against Uzteki could be tough. But my fear, because I've seen Caleb train, and I like Caleb playing. Me too. My only fear with Caleb is activity in the ring. That's my only fear with him, because he has a habit where he'll make you miss 50 shots. Right. And he'll throw four. And that's what I'm saying. And you'll saying. be like, ah. That's what you're kind of saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of a, a such a clash to see the uh, the output of Ramirez. I mean, uh, yeah, Ramirez and then um, Benavides. I mean, these are guys that are letting their hands go, you know, in different ways and whatnot. And uh, even somebody like Jesse Hart is knocking out guys that, that went the distance with Caleb. So I just wonder how his uh, – I'm just trying to envision how his, uh, you know, his style matches up with some of those guys. Because I'd like to see uh, Caleb get him a title or have a, at least have a shot at one. He will have a shot at a title because he's the number one contender and DeGale's going to fight Yusteki. And when those two fight, the winner of that, the number one contender will be Caleb Plant. So he'll get a chance at a belt. He will beat James DeGale if he fought James DeGale, but I don't think James DeGale is going to beat Yuskateki. Yeah, that's, that's going to be tough. to be honest, am I saying his name wrong? No, I mean, I, I say who's category, but, you know, whatever. I, I think I think if you ask five guys, there'd be five different pronunciations. I mean, I know I'm probably saying the name wrong. I'm just like the guy, the Jose from San Diego. We'll say it like that. Um, to me Caleb's a really really good fighter it's just it just comes down to because I think he beats Benavides I'll be honest I think he beats Benavides it just comes down to him putting in and the thing I like about Caleb the most is he's he's a fighter he's down to fight right right and a lot of people don't understand that that means a lot like if you punch him in the chin, he's not going to say, I got punched in the chin. He's going to say, oh, my God, I lost my daughter years ago. I'm fighting for her. And that matters that he's fighting for something bigger than just a, a belt. He's fighting for his family. And that matters. So I really like Caleb Plant. I think he will be a world champion. I just don't really know. It's He's a guy where he has to get that good style when he gets his title shot. Right. Because I think there will be volume guys that could give him problems. Okay. That's kind but of... Porky Medina's a volume guy and he didn't give him problems. So what do I know? Right. Uh, Hey man, I appreciate your time again. I look forward, uh, you know, to the next time we get to wrap. I know sometimes you'll hit me up, uh, you know, out of the blue and, and we just do a quick 10 or 15 minutes or something. So, uh, I just always appreciate the invites and, and thanks for the, uh, you know, the compliments on what I try to do and uh, just appreciate you, man. Man, I appreciate you so much. I'll have you on the show soon. I've been on the road like crazy. I leave again tomorrow, but um, I'm very grateful and honored that people want to hear my opinions on boxing and I'm thankful that you reach out and let me talk while I eat dinner. <laughs> All right. Hey, take care, Lukey. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on again. I can't wait to listen to this on iTunes, Google Play, and all podcast platforms. Thank you, sir. Take care.